Stay tuned for the Joan Quinn Profiles. Joan served the state of California as a member on the Arts Council and on the Film Commission. She was formerly on the Architectural Commission and fulfilled two terms on the Fine Arts Commission for the city of Beverly Hills. As an editor for Andy Warhol's Interview Magazine, Condé Nast Publications, and the Hearst Corporation, Joan covered the world of fashion, the mysteries of food, the excitement of theater, and the international art scene. She continues to find people who are on the cutting edge of their professions. Here's Joan Agajanian Quinn. Hi, I'm Joan Quinn, and welcome to the Joan Quinn Profiles. We're taping here at the historic Max Factor building, which houses the Hollywood Museum. And our guests are actress Sherry Belafonte and director Becca Wolf. Writer, director Becca Wolf was born and raised in California's San Lorenzo Valley. She studied at the uh, McGill University, right? You better keep right. <laughs> yes. and earned a BFA from the New School and an MFA from Yale in directing. Becca's written, produced, and uh, directed plays on East Coast and West Coast stages. So tell me, I've never heard of the San Lorenzo Valley, really? and I'm a native Californian. It's a really funny place because Santa Cruz is so progressive and, you know, and full hippie. of hippies. <laughs> and where I grew up, it was cowboy boots and line dancing. It and was? Oh, so it was really valley stuff, Very huh? Very valley stuff. Cowboy Valley, right. Yeah, yeah. So how did you end up at McGill then from there? And you were in pre-med. Yeah, my family is not an artist family. Oh. So when I, you know, expressed interest in being an artist, they <laughs> yeah. were not... 100% behind that. They're very supportive. But no, you have to be a doctor. But yes. <laughs> Is that right? It was, um, it was understood that I should uh -huh. at least try. So, um, so I had wanted to go abroad, uh -huh. and that was a place that, you know, I, I had been to Montreal and just thought, what an incredible city. And so I went, learned a little bit of French, learned a little bit of biochemistry. It is a great city, isn't it? Oh, it's such but a then how city. does being a doctor pre-med morph into writing and directing? Um, well, I was always a theater nut. I mean, when I was a kid, that was the one thing to do in the San Lorenzo Valley besides well, Where would you dance. go to the theater, though? <laughs> we did theater. There was a little community theater. Oh, you did? Oh. And so we did mu summer musicals. So I was very active in that. Oh. And then uh, Shakespeare Santa Cruz. When you were in Yale, you were in the master's program. And did you get most of your directing? Um, did you get your directing chops <laughs> from I, there, I, in a way? Yeah, I mean, I think I, I had kind of started on a producer track. Oh. Um, I had been, so I dropped out of med school, and then I went uh, <laughs> sort of um, uh, searching, as one does when one is young, and so I ended up in Atlanta, Georgia, which has a very thriving theater community and ended up with some small companies there producing shows. Oh. So I just, you know, that was kind of the next logical step. You've been Edinburgh, and you've had your work on all these different stages. Does it make a difference where you are? When I came to L.A. after school, everyone thought I was sort of out of my mind. because you mean out of Yale? Yeah, because everybody goes to New York. That's the, right. Unless you come from, you know, a European capital city. The only place to or go. Or your father's a producer, director. <laughs> right. Or there's that, which happens often. But, uh, but not in your family. Not in my family. No, no. Um, but uh, if you don't go to New York, everybody sort of feels like, oh, well, you've, you know, either you've given up or you're doing something else. So the idea of coming to L.A., um, film and television is very much on the fringe of what, of what, what I do and what people from the yeah, drama school tend to right. do. So, um, but I really wanted to be somewhere where I felt like I had a lot of artistic freedom and where there were a lot of sort of maverick artists who wanted to do things that were hybrid forms and things that no one had ever really seen before. And I found my, and I lived in New York for about six years, and I found that producing work there was, the audience kind of knew what, the, what they wanted in a different way, and so they... They're, the reviewers said the same things they all the time. The they do the same things too, don't they? Yeah. yeah. 
this mentality must have come out of Mr. Shea's work. I think it probably did. I think so. And I think because you keep talking about being on the outside of the box. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> Well, I think coming from a place like Santa Cruz, or yeah. you know, even outside of outside of the box, you uh -huh. know that. Uh, yeah, exactly. But when when you were at Yale and mm -hmm. you were directing, were there were they just students, or did they bring people from out, uh, like from New York, to come in and do plays? Actors uh, who were experienced. They. It was a little bit of both. Was for, it? For our productions, it was all student actors. I see. Um, and then uh, the Yale Rep, which is the big, it's a regional right, theater that, yeah. that the school is attached to. So we would work on shows there. Um, and there were some more um, experienced actors, some high profile actors. That's what I wondered, yeah. Um, and uh, so our work with them was sort of on, we were sort of on the fringes of that in of terms that of too. observing what what the master directors were doing with them. Ah. But there were great theater actors like Bill Camp. I don't know if you know yeah. Bill Camp is a, a wonderful theater actor. He worked with um, Robert, Robert Woodruff, who's a That's... master. And so it was neat so to watch them. So you had these people and... coming in. When you, you directed Usher, a musical, yes, yes. right? Uh, Award-winning musical yes. in 2008. But did you do that here? No, at the New York Fringe. Oh, you did that at yeah. the New York Fringe. Yeah, and that was with um, a, couple, a composer and lyricist from who were undergrads at Yale when I was there. Did, did, you, did you do that before you came to L.A.? I did. Oh, so you yeah. had already experienced that. Yeah. Yeah, I did. Um, in terms of musicals, I think that was the most uh, fully fleshed out. I did a couple mm -hmm. of musicals while I was at Yale. I did a... Um, there's something at Yale called the Cabaret, mm. which is the student-run theater space, and it's kind of where we go to blow off steam artistically. Uh -huh. It's a basement theater, and um, you know everything gets done in a week and for five dollars, and <laughs> then people come from the, from throughout the community. So um, uh, I worked with a playwright named Dorothy Fortenberry and her husband, who's a composer named Colin Wamsgans, who are here in town. So why did you start with musicals then? Um, uh, my initial, my first, first time ever enjoying theater was was dancing in musicals. Oh, and dancing. Yeah. Were you you danced? I was in a them? dancer. But why do you think uh, musicals hold this popularity? I think musicals ha they, no. Being a person who who I feel like really um, experienced my formative years in musicals, I feel like <laughs> I have a worldview which is so I just believe anything is possible. And I think that when you watch the old movie musicals, you can see where that comes from, that there's this, like, if you can accept that people break out into song, yeah. that you can kind of accept that magic exists, you right. know? Your musicals seem to be a little different from watching it on film right. and having Doris Day start singing, right? I think our, um, especially for people like my age and younger, I feel like I was probably, I'm of probably the last generation of people Some that... Music. Right, who know, who, yeah, who know kind or, of the old style. Or cared about it, really. Yeah. So your last days of Mary Stewart is in production now. Yes, yeah, so we have been working on the um, script and score for about two years. Oh, really? What's the story? Um, so the story of the musical is, it's the story of the last days of Mary, Queen of Scots, mm -hmm. who had, uh, she was probably trying to take over the whole shebang there in, in England. She'd been kicked out of Scotland, and um, Queen Elizabeth's court locked her up as soon as she got there. So this is kind of the crisis at the end of her life where all of these people seem to be after Elizabeth, and then Elizabeth goes after Mary. So ha you wrote the music? Uh, I wrote the words. You wrote the words. Yeah. And who wrote the music? Um, John Nixon and Byron Carr, who are in a band called Tony. Which so is a local band. So what kind of music is it? Oh, it's, a, it's Tony is a local band. Yeah. So is it pop or rock? Or? It's electronica. Oh, right. I wanted to ask you what? This yeah. is an electronica opera. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> right? Yes, exactly. Okay, what is that? Um, so <laughs> the, the style of music, it's, the band talks about it as being heavily influenced by um, kind of the pop music of, the early 80s, kind of um, Grace Jones and ah. um, New Order and bands like that that have a very, there's an electronic sound right there, these drum machines. And, and Tony is like that now? Yeah. And, and, so, very, and that's your opera? Yeah, so it's, it's really interesting because I feel like the way that music 
kind of popular music, indie music, has, um, has developed. People have, music fans have gotten so interested in all kinds of weird stuff. You know, there are these kind of art rock bands. Yeah, but you like that. Oh, you yeah. love this weird stuff <laughs> <laughs> because that's all I keep hearing or seeing or reading that's about true. is that like how you're going to push the boundaries out. Yeah. And with this Mar this uh, last days of Mary Stewart, how do you push the boundaries out? Um, well, I, I costumes costumes costumes. It's a very it's it's very contemporary. The idea is that you really feel like you're watching a rock show. You know, it's a, it's oh, a concert. Oh, really? Yeah. And, and there's a story, and you understand that the, the singers are singing as characters, uh -huh. and, you know, things change, and there are events. But mostly it's, um, it feels like um, the songs come out of the fact that, that there's a, a rock band on stage, that there's a... How many um, people are on stage? There, there's a band of three, oh, and there then is. a chorus of three, oh. and then there are four principals. Wow, so it's a big production, and I, I want, can't wait to see it. I'm and so I glad. thank you, Becca, yes, for absolutely. coming. absolutely. And I thank you for watching the Joan Quinn Profiles, this part of it, and <laughs> stay tuned for Sherry Belafonte. We're here taping at the beautiful Hollywood Museum in the more beautiful old Max Factor building. I'm with actress, photographer, singer, Sherry Belafonte, who was born and raised in New York and graduated with a BFA from Carnegie Mellon University. You've seen her on TV as a host, a spokeswoman, in numerous commercials, and acting in the popular series Beyond Reality and Hotel and hotel. Sherry spends her time behind the camera as well as being in front of it. She's had a production company which deals with commercials um, and a career as a fine artist now. So you've gone both ways in front and behind the camera. And your work is at that fantastic gallery of Dimitri's at uh, 446 in Palm Springs. Mm -hmm. That's correct. <laughs> and he adores your work and adores you. I adore him. <laughs> What's not to adore? <laughs> well, now, here we have a Belafonte right. who only took a stab at music for that long. You were a big hit in Europe. I had, I had a couple of moments, a couple of brief moments in Europe. And uh, <laughs> my, the very first, I, think, I almost feel like it was the last time that I had a big hit here. I sang the national anthem and the Canadian national anthem at the All-Star Game in the Houston Astrodome. It's the one and only time. That you I did? Mean, that was the only time you sang in America? Sang because you in were America. in Germany, right? It was big. I, it's actually, I sang here first. Oh. And I sang at the Houston Astrodome, and I thought, if I'm going to sing... Oh, is that right? <laughs> you sing in front of 60,000 people right off the bat, and it scared me so to death. <laughs> I, I thought, can't believe never going to do this. So the next time I got an offer to sing, it was for uh, this record company in Germany. It was Metronome Records. Oh. And I said, you know, I, I'm kind of scared about doing it live. And they said, no, you don't have to sing live. We sing everything to playback, and you do the shows oh. like their equivalent of American Bandstand, those kinds of oh, shows. Oh, is that what they were? You know, those, it's those types of shows. Shows and you always hang to play it back. So I would always just sing to my record on all those shows, and that's how I had a career over in Europe. You went to boarding school. I started Why did boarding you go school. to boarding school? I wanted to go to boarding school. My older sister, who's six years older than me, we started going to boarding school in the high, in junior high, and I oh, couldn't did. wait to go to the school that she was in in Massachusetts. And where was that? Uh, it was in uh, Lenox, Massachusetts. Oh, it was Lennox, called Windsor yeah. Mountain. And so you would go back and forth. Did you go home over the weekends? Uh, no, I stayed in school the whole time. Oh, I was, you did? I started, I uh, went to school two years early. I was 12 years old. I went to high school. Yeah, you were this brilliant girl, weren't God, you? You, you know, finished Carnegie Mellon in early. Three years. Yeah. And, yeah, I was, I was, I, I liked getting through school. Do you think that was because your sister was a role model and you were th going after I what think you I did? just wanted to get out of school soon. You get to Carnegie Mellon and you have all these career choices. Right. And I decided to get in the business. But, you know, it's funny because I studied production. I wanted to be in production and design. And when I got out to California, I had every intention of being behind the camera. I wanted to be in production. Oh, you were going to do that. I thought I was going to be a director-producer. Um, and in production design, I actually had more of an idea of being behind the camera. Did you do that in college? I did that did in college. Did you take those classes? That's what I studied in, at Carnegie Mellon. 
Oh, so the so And you... when I came out, a friend of mine was in a movie with Tony Danza. It was called Hollywood Nights. And she said, come down to the set. And I bought my camera because I thought maybe I'll get a picture of Tony Danza. Maybe oh. I'll get a picture of some of these celebrities. But you and were it was the makeup using... artist that, that discovered me. Wait, she so, so you were using your camera at that time? I had my camera and I was going to take pictures of behind the scenes, of, you know, this show, at the, of this movie. And the makeup artist was the one that said, Are you, you know, come in the makeup trailer and get ready. And I went, get ready for what? And she said, aren't you one of the extras? Aren't you in this scene? Oh. And I said, no, 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 no. I just came to see a friend of mine. And she said, well, you should be acting and modeling. And I went, oh. Don't be silly. Is that right? And she said, no, absolutely, you should be doing this. And I said, oh, pshaw, you know, forget that. But and you she did said, have and a... she said, you could be making money. Well, and you I did went, have an acting career then. I, so I didn't at that it? point. No, but that was the beginning that of it? That was the beginning of it. And you did do a lot I of movies. I sent pictures. And what happened was a friend of mine sent a picture of me. It was just really, I said, take a picture of me. What the hell, I'd, I'll try. And I sent a picture. I sent out 10 headshots. And Nina Blanchard, who was... <laughs> of course, Nina Blanchard. <laughs> Nina Blanchard, who was, at the time, the queen of modeling here in California. because yes, I knew I knew you from course, modeling. It right. was from Nina, Nina then. Nina saw my picture and signed me up. And she signed me as Sherry Harper, because I was married at the time. All right. And didn't know I was Harry Belafonte's daughter. She didn't know. And which was good. Which was my intention. I sort of thought, if I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this to see if Sherry Harper can work. And it wasn't until I was signed up, I think it was about six months, that she found us at one of the bookers and, you know, that's Harry Belafonte's daughter. <laughs> Nina was so mad at me. But Nina, because Nina loved to, to dwell on that and to, to and put she, her people up that way. That's right. So she, Nina said, well, you, what are you, crazy? She used the F word. She said, what are you, wah, 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 can we say yeah. the F word? Because <laughs> she did. She loved to do that because she loved the celebrity and, and to said, make her model celebrities. And she said, and she said, you're crazy not to use it because you'll work. Did she? Yeah. She's right. She was right, actually. And as soon as I started using my name, I stopped getting paid. <laughs> <laughs> because, you know, as your celebrity, you're not going to get paid doing covers. So Sherry Harper a, did a lot of modeling. Sherry Harper Harper made, you know, $150 for a mag <laughs> for an interview magazine cover, but as soon as Sherry Harper, I uh, Sherry Belafonte, the actress, we didn't get paid. Did you did you ever do any journalism work? You mean writing? Yes. I actually did some uh, writing for a couple of travel magazines. Oh, and you also, but you were an assistant in a PR firm. Uh, not a PR firm. I was an assistant publicist to Hanna-Barbera. Oh, pu publicist. Animation. So you publicist. had to write then. I was writing, you know, <coughs> actually I was writing a lot of uh, fan letters for all the cartoon characters. Sending them in. <laughs> I, was, I was writing fan mail for, you know, Fred Flintstone. But what did your mother do? My mother was a child psychologist, family therapist, and she was on the White House Commission, commission for uh, Native American Affairs because she was a Native American. Oh, she wasn't a journalist mm -mm. or a dancer. No, or, no oh. that was my stepmother. Oh, my stepmother okay. was a was a was a dancer because that's where I thought you had a dancing career as well yeah. somewhere in there. No, no, but your mother was on the White House Commission for Native American Affairs and for Aging and Youth, and she was one oh, of the for designers. Aging, uh -huh. that's and she was great. also one of the uh, designers of Head Start. Well, that's the reason you're so involved in charity work. We're going through your. Through, through your careers. So we have you modeling. <laughs> got the modeling, got the photography. And we have you playing, your, do you play yourself in commercials, were you? Uh, I played myself in commercials, yeah. Well, you know, do, you're doing Slim Fast, obviously, at Sherry Belafonte. Oh, I'm right. doing, you know, getting fat or getting skinny. Or... Did you do that for a long time? Slim Fast? I did Slim Fast because, you know, um, I, I got into a discussion with them because a lot of the Slim Fast stuff was made with a milk base. And so many of the people, especially ethnic people, had a problem. They were lactose intolerant. So I got into a whole conversation oh. with them about you got to make a product that's, you know, oh, that's really? that they milk can free. Yeah. Same thing happened with, um, very funny, because I started off with uh, Lowry's seasoning salt. And I said, can you guys make some of this stuff without MSG? Were you a spokesman for those I things? Was so you were, I'm Sherry Belafonte talking about Lowry's products. And I was the one who told Lowry's, you got to make some of this stuff without MSG. There's so many people who are allergic to it. If I had a penny for every good idea that I gave I these companies, say, I'd be billionaire today. <laughs> but it's honesty more than anything, isn't it? I think, well, you know, I, I was very fortunate the, uh, the Wall Street Journal actually touted me as one of the best spokespersons. And it wasn't because I was such a brilliant actress. It really was because I believed in the products that I was talking about. That's what about. I was going to say. You believed in and that. And it was because I would have the conversation. Sometimes the ad companies would go, you can't be this outspoken. I said, look. I, all I can do is be honest with them and say, this is what works, and this is the reason why it works, and this is the reason why they would pay me a lot of money. Is but then I don't. people believe you when you go on camera, right? I mean, I, the I'd like to believe so, because I was yeah. telling them the truth. Exactly. Then how did you get this TV series? 
Oh, the hotel? Yeah. Hotel was very funny. It, it was, again, it was telling the truth. <laughs> I walked it was, in. I went back to I showed up to the audition. I didn't want to go to the audition. It was the audition. I got a call to go in for this audition. And they said, I'm not going. It's 5 o'clock. I'm home. And my agent said, go, go, go. I said, no. And they said, no, go. And so I showed up. And all the line was, was, good morning, Mr. Smith. Can I help you? And they said, would you like to go out and win the line? And I, again, with the F word, I said, not what? It's like, good morning, Mr. Smith. Can I help you? What's the big deal? I can say it. <laughs> I could say it. And so then they said, all right. And I showed up in clogs and I, like, like these clogs and leg warmers. And I said, good morning, Mr. Smith. Can I help you? And I had such an attitude. It was perfect. <laughs> and I said, we love her. And we Betty, love Davis, her. Betty Davis was the one that said, and I was only supposed to do the pilot. And Betty Davis, who was in the pilot, wow. said, you said to Aaron Spelling, hire this girl for the whole season. You're kidding. Because she was, was so tough too, but, but your voice she ended up and your attitude. Doing the pilot, she ended up getting very sick, and Ann Baxter ended up taking her place, oh. just like in All About Eve. Oh, you're kidding! But that's how I ended up. But doing she was time. very honest, and she had that attitude and that voice, and she saw it in you. I guess so. Oh, that's great. <laughs> so here you are. You're a steady cam. I'm a a steady certified. Cam operator. Certified steady cam operator. And tell us what that is. It's a rig where the camera kind of floats. It works on a ball bearing, so it's it, it's a heavy. It's a, the rig heavy, is heavy. It's yeah. a whole harness that you wear, and you put your camera on this ball bearing floating thing, so that when you watch a movie and you see the camera kind of floats. But how, why would you do that? Because I love taking pictures, and it just is <laughs> such a great look. Right? Am I right? We love you know you love that look, and I I wanted. I always want to learn new things. But could you take stills with that? Well, you don't want to. That's a no, movie No, that's a movie. You so can, I guess, but what's the but point? Because, <laughs> because you can do this. Right. Did you go to Cuba to make a film with your dad? I went to Cuba. To, well, dad shot a movie, was shooting a movie for HBO, which was called Sing Your Song. It's, it was, it's been on. And I think it, you can you know, Netflix it or Hulu it now. Um, and he asked me to go to Cuba with him to shoot some footage of him in Cuba interviewing uh, Fidel, because he and Fidel are, are good, quite friends. And but he wanted some footage. You? This was just a couple of years ago. Okay. So he asked me to come to Cuba to shoot the, him doing an interview with, with Fidel and to shoot him walking around Cuba. So I did not take my steady cam. It was just handheld <laughs> stuff, <laughs> and handheld. tripod, so that I could do some quick stuff. And you took and I took my still camera as well yeah. to shoot. And while I was there, I was videoing him walking around Cuba and interviewing him, talking to people in Cuba. And on occasional moments I have free, I would whip up this still camera and shoot. Honestly. And then, do, so did you actually do the movie then? Were you called the director, or were you? No, just... no, it was just I was just I was like B camera. You'll see You're the just... credits go by, and there's like and and Sherry Belafonte <laughs> with but you, twenty other camera operators. But you were with Fidel. I was with Fidel, and yes. he was okay at that time. He was, he's still good, yeah. Oh, and right. Raul, the brother who's now also the president. Of, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Great. I know I remember meeting him. I was mesmerized because he's right? like, Larger you know, than life. when you meet leaders of a country, no matter what country it is, That's they right. have something about them. When you get into their aura, they're fantastic. It's aren't amazing. They? Absolutely. You are. You are sucked right in. I know. <laughs> and I know some people go, you know, they're I like, know, but I was. And I go, you, you just don't get it when you're there. It's and Nelson Mandela is the same. Oh, I bet. Uh, I met Princess Di. It's the same thing. It's that. You just you know that these people are larger than, than exactly. life. Exactly, they're certainly larger than your life or well, my life. And you so. know they're there for a reason because right. you are mesmerized by their aura. That's right. And same thing with Arafat. I went mm -hmm. like, oh, Arafat is the most unattractive person you'd ever want to meet. You sit with him and he opens his mouth and you can't believe it. Right. You're like, I'm with the leader, and that's the, I guess that's the thing that happened with you. Well, one of the several series that you've done on photography, because we're in Cuba now, right? right? <laughs> uh, and those sh those were showing at the 446 Gallery. Uh -huh, right. um, was I looked at the pictures, and I saw this picture of Venice. Oh, Italia. That's, and that's I one thought, of the shows I had this, in is, this can't be Sherry's photograph. It's very old. <laughs> so is Sherry. <laughs> but it looks very old. It does, doesn't it? Something that you do with your camera those it's not what I do when I can't what's funny is that you know what you, you know why they look old because they're shot on film <laughs> That's most but they on. had this quality I of... shot uh, Kodak had a film which people just didn't you just don't use and it was called recording film it was a beautiful black and white film it was a little costly. It was about $10 a roll as opposed to the $4 a roll that we play. And you could set the ASA on this film to whatever you wanted. And uh, it was very grainy. 
And it was, that's and what it was. It just had this old look to it. And okay. that's what I shot this entire, it was Beautiful. They're, they're 25 years old, but that's it. They just were shot. And I think those are the, the photographs that look like paintings. I mean, those are the photographs that cool, uh, right? are at 446 that people love. And those want. are not at 446. Those, the, that's the show I'm going to bring. Those were in New York. Those are, the, oh, they were? Those were at the Chair in the Maiden Gallery. And I and it's funny because Dimitri said, you know, if we do another show, when when we do another show, he said, what would you do? And I said, no, I don't know. Maybe I want to do Italia. Yeah. Well, because those would be the that's ones the show that you people would come to? want. I will come to that. Okay. But, so I'm looking through your paintings, <laughs> through the paintings. I'm photos. calling them paintings, but they're photos. Okay. And Russia Hour. And I went, Cuba. I think she's made, a, I didn't see Cuba. Oh. I just saw Rush Hour. Oh, okay. And I thought, this is a, some postcard <laughs> from Los Angeles. <laughs> this is not uh, something that she could take. This is too old. And I looked at it and studied it and looked at it. I went, the cars are old, but the buses look like they could be. But she couldn't have taken the photo. And then I saw Cuba, and they look like postcards. That's, How'd you that was do the show. that? The show's called Postcards from Cuba. Oh, is it? <laughs> <laughs> well, I didn't know that. But how do you do that? Because there's a quality. Those of the have work. you been to? You haven't been to Cuba. Yes, I have twice. That's the colors in Cuba. I know, but you 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 caught them in a different way. You didn't catch them in a bright, you know, jarring that was, way. That's the colors of Cuba. That's there was nothing that I did. It was there like was no you had painted. Those, those I just pictures. was sitting in the car. We were waiting for a light. It was right there, in, you know, in the Havana, <laughs> waiting for the. I was waiting for the traffic. I was shooting through the windshield. That's fantastic. And it's, you, as you know, it's those old cars. It's those cars I that know, it's Cuba's locked together. Havana's like, <laughs> that's glued together because it's like chewing gum and and hay. Exactly. And it's those old cars and the new buses because the buses are all brought in from Korea. Exactly. So, so the you've got the new like, cars that are coming in from Korea and the old cars that are still from from old Fords. From it kept me looking South at America. it for a long, long time. Um, do you do your your Shows in series, like would you shoot all Italian or all Cuban or all the flowers? Because I know you did calla lilies and different things. You know, it, it really depends on who's curating the show at the time. Uh -huh. um, John and David, who own the Chair and the Maiden Gallery in New York, that uh, have curated the three or four shows that I've done there. When I've sent them photos, they have curated. They've decided. And they've what they decided want. which ones they've wanted, and they've kept it in a theme. So uh, I did Italia there, Mythostries, which is a science fiction thing that I've done, which is manipulated through Photoshop. That is a whole other, I think I sent you a couple of pictures maybe from that that are all kind of these weird, strange little weird pictures. Um, that was one show that there was, I think they had 25 pictures from that that were there. Um, then Cubo, Postcards from Cuba, I think there was 25 or 30 pictures from that. Uh, Italia, the same thing, I think I had 25, 30 pictures from there. Um, in uh, uh, in uh, Dimitri's shows, there was two or three other photographers. Uh, yes, he did a group. Oh, yeah, he had a group. He I think there were seven show, or eight yeah. people, different right. people. So, you know, there was probably seven pieces or 18 pieces. So he had a theme. One show was Yin Yang. Yes, and yeah. So, um, you know, they, so usually they're from the same group. Uh, but, you know, it depends on and who's what doing he's it. for, what, what, what the show is for. Well, I'm so glad you came here with your photography career you. to talk about. That's it. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank and we'll you. see you again when you have another career. I, and, you know, I will probably have one. I, know. I we'll still have you. a good few years left, I think. <laughs> and thanks for watching. Keep writing to J-A-Q-U-I-N-N at AOL.com. J-A-Q-U-I-N-N-1 at AOL.com. And we'll see you next time on the Joan Quinn Profiles.